Gospel lesson, in a way, picks up where we left off last week. Uh, last week, we talked about the light that came into the world in Jesus Christ, that the people who were walking in darkness had seen a great light. Jesus was quoting in the passage we read that week, the prophet Isaiah, talking about upon Zebulun and Naphtali, these little piddly sort of tribes of Israel that were often taken into captivity because they were in a vulnerable position, that the light had been shining on them now. And as I said, this came after Jesus was baptized, after he was tested and tempted in the wilderness, and before he called his first disciples. And what does he do after he calls his disciples? He takes them up the hillside, and a crowd follows, and he sits down and he teaches them. And we call this teaching the Sermon on the Mount, or in Luke, the Sermon on the Plain, because in that one, Jesus comes down the hill and they all are on level ground. But in Matthew's version, we're reading very familiar words. And the trouble with reading very familiar words in church is sometimes your mind wanders. It's a short little passage, but it's an important one. So I hope you will pay attention. We're reading from Matthew's Gospel from the fifth chapter, just three verses, 14, 15, and 16. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I don't know how much you know about insects and other critters, but there are basically two kinds of insects. Positively phototactic insects and negatively phototactic insects. If you don't know what that is, I didn't know what it was either until I did a little research this week. Phototaxis is what happens when insects are drawn to the light. And if you've seen moths, when you've been sitting out on your porch at night or you've been around a campfire, they're drawn to light. They're called positively phototactic insects. And then there are the ones that are sort of repelled by lights. And I hope you've never had to live with roaches, but I lived in Washington, D.C. and lived with roaches. They're the kind that when the lights come on, they scurry into the dark corners so as not to be found. Well, scientists have debated for years why there are some insects who are drawn to light. And they're really sort of at odds and they're not quite sure. They think it has something to do with navigation. And the natural sources of light, the light that comes from the sun and the light that is reflected from the moon at night, are natural sources of light. And they help these insects to navigate during the day. They help them to find the correct path. But sometimes even a fire, which has been around for quite some time, or a light bulb on a porch will draw them. And even the light of a bug zapper will draw them. And that doesn't quite seem fair, but that's what happens, we know. So I want us to ask ourselves, are we the kind of people who are drawn to light or who are repelled by light? And more than that, look at what Jesus is saying to his disciples here. No longer are they called to follow the light of the world. They're called to be the light of the world. They're not called to become the light of the world. Jesus says, if you are in me, because they've already gotten out of the boats and followed him. They've gotten up from the tax collector's table. They've left behind their old lives and they're following him. So they have seen the light that has been shining in the darkness that the darkness will not overcome. And they follow him. And then he turns to them and he says, you are the light of the world. I can just imagine them sitting there going, who? Me? The light of the world? Quite, quite an expectation to be the light, the one who draws others from darkness into new reality. We got the same thing from the writer of Ephesians. Most traditional scholars believe that Paul wrote it. Others think it's someone who wrote years later under Paul's name talking about what it is to live in the light, to live in God's way, to live under Christ's command, under the lordship and the reign and the kingdom of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And he puts it in very similar words, the writer of this epistle. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of the light. And that's a little bit hard for us to understand, isn't it? And in the gospel, not the gospel, I'm sorry, the epistle to the Ephesians, there are all sorts of examples that to us maybe seem antiquated. Wives, be subject to your husbands. 
slaves be subject to your masters. We have to remember that the context in which this was written was the context that they thought Christ was returning imminently. And it didn't matter what situation you were in. This is not, and although it has been used that way to defend slavery, this is not a passage that defends the enslavement of other human beings. If you think it is, think back to Moses and the Exodus. Go to the Pharaoh, tell him I said to let my people go because I know they're suffering and I've come down to deliver them. But we tend to get bogged down sometimes in looking at light and darkness, especially from the perspective of Ephesians, in terms of pietistic behavior, what we do as individuals, whether we drink, smoke, cuss, fool around, things like that, as opposed to what we are in our core. And if we are the light of Christ in the world, if we're called to reflect his light, then we're called to be a different sort of people. We're called to be a people of justice and kindness and mercy. Look at what we read, what Mark read this morning in the call to worship from Psalm 112. Happy are those who fear the Lord, not who are afraid that God is going to zap them at any moment, but those who understand who God is and who we are in relationship to God, those who stand in awe at the power of God and understand that without God we are nothing, that we are creatures created by a loving creator who then calls us his children. We are the children of God. We're given the power to become the children of God. And those who fear the Lord, who delight in his commandments, they will rise in the darkness as the light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. Those who show justice and mercy are showing the light of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of time in prayer this week. I prayed every day for several hours about the inauguration of the new president, Joe Biden. I prayed because of what had happened in the Capitol just two weeks before when rioters, a mob, were stirred to try to take over the government. And I didn't know what was going to happen the day of the inauguration because people were planning to do something similar there and at the state houses across the nation. I spent hours in prayer. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would pray myself back to sleep for peace and justice and civility to prevail so that we might know peace and prosperity in our land. Ronald Reagan once referred to our nation as a city on a hill. That is an image from the teaching of Jesus today. But we have to be careful when we talk about America or any earthly kingdom as the savior of the world because there is one savior, it is Jesus Christ, and we're called to come to him. And sometimes we disagree. Later, after the riot in the Capitol, a video was released that showed what some of these people were doing when they got into the Senate chamber. One of them has become rather famous. He had horns on his head, and he's called the QAnon Shaman. For a while, he stood in the upper gallery, sort of howling and pounding a spear that had an American flag hanging from it. Later, as he made his way to the floor, he went to the speaker's desk and sat in the chair occupied by the vice president when the Senate is in session. And he left a threatening note for Mike Pence and in vulgar language called for his assassination. Hang Pence, hang Pence. And then what confounded me greatly was that he prayed. He prayed thanking Jesus for allowing the mob to, quote, send a message to all tyrants, the communists and the globalists, that this is our nation and not theirs. We have to pray for discernment. If we're to be the light of the world, if we're to be the light shining in darkness for others, we have to pray for God's discernment, that we are leading people in the true path and not to the bug zapper. We have to believe that the God of mercy and justice and peace is above all nations, even our own. And I love, I love America. I am so glad I was born here. I had the freedom to become a pastor, even as a woman. I had the freedom to vote in every election since I was 18 years old. I've had the freedom to protest or to speak publicly, not words of hate, but words of hope. I have the freedom to come to church, any church or temple or synagogue 
or mosque because of being born in this great nation. But we are called to be the light for the world. You don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. You don't light a lamp and hide it away. When you light a lamp, you put it up as high as it can go so others can see and find their way. Not to us and our good works. Look at what it says. It says that we are the light of the world. We are put in this position so that others may see our good works but give glory to our Father who is in heaven. We are the light lighting the way to Christ. Like I said last week, there is no such thing as moonlight. But the moon reflects the sun to the point that when the moon is full, when the earth is in the right position and the earth can see the full face of the moon reflecting the light, you can navigate in the dark, just like a moth on its way to safety. There's an expression that's a slang word that used to mean something else, and now it means something even better. It used, the word is lit. When someone was lit, that meant they were inebriated. But now, when something is exciting and wonderful and glorious, it's called lit. Jesus is calling us to be lit in the world. Not in the inebriated sense, although at Pentecost, they wondered if they were drinking because they were so overflowing with the Holy Spirit. But to be excited about our faith, to be excited about sharing and bringing people to Jesus Christ, to be excited about being the light that is put in the world because we used to be in darkness. We used to be darkness. Before Christ, we had no idea. We were stumbling and fumbling around. But now in Jesus Christ, we are light, and we are called to live as children of light. Mobs can grow in all sorts of ways. Back in the days of the Colosseum, even after Constantine in the 300s, converted to Christianity, the Colosseum was still a place of bloodlust and blood sport where people often died. And St. Augustine, one of the church fathers, wrote of a man who went to the Colosseum with his friends, hoping to lead them in a better way. And he went intending to close his eyes and not watch what was happening. And what happened to him was this. These are the words of St. Augustine. For as soon as he saw that blood, he therewith drunk down with savageness, nor turned away, but fixed his eye, drinking in frenzy, unawares, and was delighted with that guilty fight and intoxicated with the bloody pastime. We have to be careful where we're looking for light. We have to be careful what light we're following because we're called to follow the light that is Christ in the world, the light of hope and healing and justice and mercy and peace. We're called to turn away from the darkness of chaos and destruction and hatred and bigotry and prejudice. We're called to stand firm in God. We're called to live as children of light that shed light by the things that we do and the things that we are. Kara sends me every week your prayer concerns, your joys and your thanksgivings. And one of her suggestions for this week I'd already planned to mention in the sermon, which is because of your faithfulness, because of your giving to this congregation, Two families who were homeless, who were trying to find a place to live that they could afford and keep a roof over their heads. A family with a child who was at the verge of staying in a car when it was in the 20s at night. Because we were able to help them, we were able to provide some temporary housing for them. They're moving into permanent housing this week, both families because of your faithfulness. That is shining the light of Jesus Christ in the world. Last week, I read the note from Jane Benikoff thanking Epworth for its faithful support in the midst of the pandemic of the Cockeysville Food Pantry, providing sustenance for our neighbors, even though some of our members have lost jobs or have had their hours cut and their incomes reduced. You continue always to reach out in love and support in justice and mercy. You pray for one another. I asked for a prayer concern on Facebook yesterday because it was Saturday, and I knew that was the fastest way to get to people, and over 150 people responded in prayer for someone they didn't even know whose name I didn't even share. 
That's how you shine the light of Jesus Christ into the world. You look to him always, above all else. You give thanks to God for being called into his great family, for being called from fishing and tax collecting and all those other occupations we had. We're not full-time disciples in the sense that we are itinerant traveling preachers who follow him through the wilderness and through the towns. But we are called to follow him with all that we have and all that we are and to stay lit so that others can come to us. One of the high points of the inauguration for me, and I watched it and I gave thanks to God because there was no riot that broke out anywhere that day that was of any noticeable way. There were protesters, and there are always protesters, regardless of who wins, regardless of who is inaugurated, there will always be protests from people who think the country went the wrong way. I was very impressed with a young woman. She is the Youth Poet Laureate of the United States now, and her name is Amanda Gorman. And she wrote a poem, and it ended this way. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. That really speaks to us as disciples of Jesus Christ. It speaks to us as Americans, I won't deny that. But it speaks to us as disciples of Jesus Christ. There is always true light, natural light, the real light, the true light that is Christ in the world. And if we are brave... We will see it around us. We will not just look for signs of destruction. We'll look for signs of hope. And then, in answer to the call, we will be the light for the world because we were darkness once before, but no more because in Jesus Christ, we are light. We're called to live as children of light. So, Epworth Church, let your light shine before others. Continue to let your light shine before others. Always let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works your justice, your mercy, your words of kindness and peace and hope and healing. And they will give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Glory to our Savior, Jesus Christ, the light no darkness can overcome. Amen.